All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. I'm actually really grateful to have the opportunity to talk today. Um, let me see if I can coach my slides into popping up. Excellent. All right. So uh, my, my goal today is to look at electronic health records as a component of uh, this concept we call a learning health system. Uh, and in particular, uh, I've, I'm aiming for this to be partly a summary of the work we've done, but also partly uh, a sort of walk through the operating characteristics of data in EHRs and the ways that they might turn out to be useful to you in projects that you're thinking about. So all of that is to say my intent is for this to be very informal. And uh, if I'm saying things that don't make sense or if you have questions about anything that I bring up, please feel free to stop me and we can try to address them. All right. Um, I do want to start with a couple of disclosures uh, just for, uh, <coughs> for, the <coughs> excuse me, for the sake of transparency. Um, I have no conflicts to, uh, to disclose, but I do write software, uh, like most people who do informatics research. And so as a matter of policy, CHOP owns the intellectual property to software I develop, and they may commercialize that someday, and I may get financial uh, recompense from that should they ever do it. So now you're aware. Uh, the other thing that I, I will mention is I'm a pediatrician and virtually every day I use drugs off label or we write software to use drugs off label because most of what we do, particularly in pediatric oncology, is not operating off of pediatric specific indications. So there will be off label uses mentioned in passing. Okay, disclosures aside, uh, to get to the discussion of the EHR, I want to do three things. I want to talk a little bit about what learning health systems are, uh, what the concept contains and how... Uh, we and others are trying to realize that in the world of electronic health records. I, I want to discuss EHRs and in particular the role of data derived from EHRs in doing what we call effectiveness research. So basically uh, applied research about uh, the, the degree to which clinical care succeeds or uh, fails to deliver the effect that you want and quality improvement. And then I'll review a set of examples uh, that are uh, unified by the thread of things we have worked on uh, that you may find useful as ways to think about different aspects of EHR derived data or um, at, at a minimum I hope will be a good catalyst for discussion. So let me start with learning health systems. Uh, fundamentally the principle that drives learning health system is the notion that every time you see a patient that should be an opportunity not just to address the patient's complaint but it should be an opportunity to get better in the way that you take care of this patient than you were last time or than you were at the start of this visit. And it should also be an opportunity to learn from this patient how to take better care of other patients. So in essence, the, the notion of the learning health system fuses our traditional no notions of research and clinical care into one continuous process. Right? One of the consequences of that is that it's not just something that, it, that we do as individual clinicians, but that the healthcare system itself needs to be reoriented so that it's actively participating in this process of learning about patients and improving health care uh, on a continuous basis in order to realize these gains. Right? And fundamentally, these principles flow at an ethical level uh, simply from the, the realization that when we see a patient, Part of what the patient is doing is coming to us with a clinical problem. Part of what they're doing also is entrusting to us information about their history and their health uh, and their physiology and part of what they can reasonably expect in entrusting that information to us is that we will make the best use of that, not just to address their problems today, but to be able to think ahead of what their problems or someone else's problem might be down the line. All right, so how does this model actually function? Uh, we envision it as this kind of continuous cycle where at the left end of the process, um, you have what we often think of as the clinical care enterprise, right? Patients and clinicians coming together uh, around specific medical problems or around specific treatments, right? But as that care is delivered, there's what we call the afferent arm of the, of the LHS active so that a learning process goes on where information from that clinical encounter uh, becomes sort of aggregated with information from other sources, other clinical encounters, uh, biology and basic research, public health data, epidemiology, and a variety of other data sources to form what we call knowledge networks, basically compendia of information that try to make the best use of all of the available knowledge. And then what completes the learning health system is this efferent arm, where that knowledge is not just there for knowledge's sake, but that knowledge is actually returned to the point of the care and used to take better care of patients. Right? This 
is something that we're fairly familiar with, right? The, the afferent arm uh, of a learning health system is the sort of thing that uh, we have talked about for a long time as, uh, you know, uh, William Osler saying uh, is a fundamental ethical imperative of medicine or us talking about bedside to bench translational research uh, or um, uh, cl clinical medicine informing biology. This, the efferent arm, is something I think we're just getting our heads around, right? I mean, it is clear that we are much better at generating good ideas about how to take care of patients than we are at actually doing them, right? And implementation science is, is, uh, is a sort of burgeoning field trying to figure out why it is that once we have figured out on the basis of strong evidence that it is better to do something in particular to take care of a patient, it takes us a decade to get that into practice, right? So part of the learning health system principle is that the system needs to be reoriented so that that's a much more efficient process. All right, how does the EHR fit into this? All right, there are two main ways at the moment that we think of the electronic health records uh, as contributing to the learning health system uh, from a data perspective. The first is, with the implementation of electronic health records, there is a sea change in the availability of data, right? So there, there's, uh, there's a wider availability of health services information, some of which has actually been electronic for quite some time, if you think about things like claims data or appointment data or to some extent laboratory data, um, some of which has not been, uh, for many practices, electronic for all that long, but, uh, but really is the kind of data we have been collecting on paper for a while. So what the EHR becomes is the source of clinical truth, right? It is the definitive record of the way people take care of patients. Uh, that's a good thing in the sense that for effectiveness research, we certainly want to know about how patients are actually being cared for. But we also need to be careful because this is centered around the enterprise of providing care for patients. And so the way that these data operate are different from the way we're thinking about research data. The second facet of sort of EHR growth in the last few years is the potential to make cognitive data more available for system level research, right? So we have always, uh, at least since we've been able to go back and, and keep good records, written down what we think about patients. In fact, uh, you know, there, there are sort of fascinating treatises on patients that are, uh, you know, hundreds of years old that, that are, um, that delineate clinical reasoning in exquisite detail. So we've always been good about capturing what we think about the patients. We haven't always made that data available, right? Typically, that's required going back and digging into the chart and reading through old notes and copying them into new notes that are available to you, but perhaps not to other folks. So one of the questions is, how does the EHR make this cognitive data more available for system level research, right? The other thing worth mentioning here is that there's also the potential to get the, the patient's input in a different way as well, right? You know, part of as clinicians, what we're used to doing is soliciting information from a patient and recording it ourselves at a clinical visit. Part of what um, we are expanding into now is trying to make that dialogue with the patient a more ongoing process and trying to make it more detailed, right? So there are these new kinds of information. The other thing that the EHR gives us the opportunity to do, if we do it right, is to actually move the collection of research data to the point of care and to make that part of the clinical interaction, right? Another one of those principles that's very important to make a learning health system work, right? Again, that's not a new concept. It's just we have done that by, uh, by means of case report forms or research associates coming in and uh, being part of visits. The more we can make that part of the clinical interaction, the better we're going to be able to connect that to uh, the process of delivering care to patients. All right, having laid out those potential benefits, I also want to uh, sort of early on call out some caveats when you're using uh, electronic health record derived data. And if you've done any projects using EHR derived data, you, you're certain to have stumbled over uh, at least one of these. Uh, the most obvious is that for most users of electronic health records, clinical care is the workflow that drives what they do, right? So the tasks they complete are the tasks they feel are necessary to take care of their patients. And if it doesn't get them perceived value in terms of patient care or billing or, or clinical documentation, it often doesn't get done, right? That's, that's a different mindset than we often, we tend to frame research studies where we're, uh, we're spending a lot more time thinking about precision and regulatory uh, regularity of data, right? Uh, 
Secondly, adoption of EHRs has been relatively limited, right? That's changing rapidly um, over the last couple of years and for the next decade, but it is still uh, more a property of large medical centers. It's more a property of uh, healthcare systems that are big enough to, to support the infrastructure, okay? Finally, there are technical barriers to using these data because uh, in practice, electronic health records are commercial products deployed by vendors to meet a clinical need. And while we are in the midst of some very fruitful conversations about how to interoperate, uh, we, we have not quite reached the, uh, the level of interoperation we would like yet. And so when you're uh, trying to integrate data across different EHR products, you need to think about ways in which not just the data model in the EHR, but the way that information is collected from the clinician changes the information that you're going to get. Uh, the last thing that I will point out here, and this has mostly to do with the efferent arm, is that EHR products at this point are mostly uh, focused around uh, recording of information and transactions, uh, and we have a long way to go to build in the kind of intelligence that we would like to see for a process of continually improving care. Okay, so having laid that background, how do we want to think about study design using the EHR? Uh, the key point here uh, that perhaps distinguishes this from uh, data, from studies using sort of study specific data is you need to know your data and you need to know your data as you sit down to analyze it, right? If I sit down today to uh, design a trial of a new therapeutic intervention, I will spend a lot of time before anybody sees a patient or anybody writes on a case report form thinking about exactly what questions I'm going to ask, exactly what answers I'm going to accept, exactly how often I need to get that data to get the information I want. For the most part, EHR studies are observational at this point, and for the most part, EHRs are not designed with that mindset, right? So one of the things you need to do is think very carefully about the way your data are put together and what factors outside of your research study uh, have driven the operating characteristics of those data, okay? Uh, on the positive side, things to think about, right? Uh, one of the things that the availability piece of EHR give you is the potential to see a large population, right? You know, um, both because large systems tend to deploy these EHRs and because part of the goal of discrete computable data is the ability to screen large amounts of data quickly, something that's not possible with chart abstraction, right? The second thing that benefits you is you need to remember that you have a lot of primary data in most EHRs, right? So you have actual vital signs, you have actual lab values, you have actual measurements for patients, things like that. So one of the things you need to ask yourself is when you're designing a research hypothesis or when you're designing a quality measure, what's the outcome you want to measure, right? Do you want to measure um, a physiologic value? Do you want to measure a clinician's interpretation of that? Do you want to measure a complication for the patient? You have those options available in a way that you don't in traditional data sources like administrative data, okay? So let's think about the structure of data in the EHR along two axes. Um, oversimplifying is everything, but I think a, a useful kind of tool, right? So what I've labeled definition uh, on the, the bottom axis here has to do with uh, how much shared information is there about what something means. If I see a word or a number in the EHR, how likely is it that you and I and somebody in San Francisco is going to mean the same thing and is going to write down the same thing when they see a patient who has the same condition, right? Um, on the y-axis here, I, I've written discreteness, and that has to do with how well you can get at a specific piece of data, right? So the best case are data that are both discrete and unambiguous, right? Things like dates, where there isn't a whole lot of confusion about what you're looking at when you look at a date. There may be lots of confusion about what that date means, right? Does it mean when you walked in the door, when you were triaged, when you were seen, when you got medication? But you know, you know that it's a date and a time, right? The same is true of some things like demographics, right? We're, we're all in fair agreement about what a date of birth is means or what a zip code of residence means. So once you have these data, as long as you understand their clinical context, the EHR is not imposing any additional ambiguity on you. That's very nice because it lets you take advantage of the computability of the data, right? So it, you, you can design algorithmic methods to, uh, algorithms to search these data and interpret them relatively rapidly. Um, you do need to be aware of the clinical background. You do need to be, to be aware of what the definitions are. 
Um, and you do need to, you, to be aware of how people use these data. Right? And we'll talk a little bit about terminologies as a way to kind of come to consensus around what some of these things mean. Right? One step down from that, our data you can get your hands on pretty easily, but it's a little harder to understand. So I'm calling these discrete but not standard data. Um, my flagship for this category of data are diagnoses. Right? So these are clearly discrete and they look like um, they're consistent. Right? There, there are uh, sets of codes that we all agree to use for common diagnoses. So you know, one's initial impression might be, well, that's like a date. Once I have a diagnosis in my hand, I'm in great shape. The problem here is actual clinical use, right? There's no guarantee that I'm going to use the same code that you're going to use for the same clinical condition. So the standardization here is limited. Uh, to some extent, lab results are uh, uh, in the same category. Uh, how great that extent is probably depends on whether you're talking to me, who's a clinician, to whom you know, a sodium of 135 is a sodium of 135, whether it was flame ionization or not, or whether you're talking to the person whose job it is in the clinical lab to make sure the analyzer uh, stays online and is robust to, uh, to causes of confounding. Okay. So the nice thing about these data is you can get your hands on them easily. You just need to be careful about how you interpret them partly because they tend to express more complex concepts, partly because there tends to be some level of interpretation between the datum you have and the patient. Uh, you know, I have a code for otitis media in front of me. Somebody had to decide whether that was acute or not acute, whether it was serous or, or not serous, that sort of thing. And so it's a little harder than saying this patient is male. Um, and then there are variations in, sort of in local usage. right? One of the main tools that we use to try to stand around this is regularized terminologies, right? So they're agreed upon consistent ways to name things. Uh, and they can be agreed upon across a study. They can be agreed upon across a health system. Ideally, they're agreed, they're agreed upon across the entire learning health system so that when I say otitis and you say otitis, we're talking about something at least reasonably close to each other. This has not been something we've been very good at in general. It's something that we're getting better at as we move from a world where you know, the uh, kind of single driving use case for terminologies was billing to a world where uh, we are relying on shared terminology for a, a number of other clinical uses. Right? So I bring these up here, not because there's an easy solution, but because you want to think about what community standards are out there when you design your studies. Right? And it's not necessarily easy. This, is, this might have been a slide that you put up, Mike, when you were giving the, uh, um, the talk on terminologies as well. Um, so it, it kind of got hacked up in the transfer to the PC. But this is looking at the 30-odd different ways to talk about uh, stages of childhood development just across different uh, healthcare and regulatory bodies in the US. So you know, we're, we're not even agreed on the definition of a term, a term like infant. right? So, Part of what you need to do is be able to integrate these terminologies, and to do that, what you need to do is know what's out there, uh, and as you're trying to pull data from different sources, know what source terminologies they were using. Okay, um, I will point out a couple of sort of leading candidates in the EHR. Right, so most um, most electronic health records represent their drugs as NDC codes because they're they're very uh, readily tied to dispensable pharmaceuticals um, in the world of meaningful use. Rx norm is going to become the standard terminology uh, at the moment, that's a bit of a stretch for most EHRs, but that's the framework you want to think in. Um, LUNC has become the standard for observations, uh, in particular lab tests, uh, but I will say that most current EHRs don't have a really good mapping of LUNC concepts to the lab results that they actually contain for patients. So use, use LUNC as an idea, to, to uh, as a framework to set up how you want to think about lab results, but probably not for another four or five years will you be able to use it as a way to get, get into the data. Uh, diagnoses are going to be a particularly interesting problem for us, right? Because in the United States, virtually all of our um, existing data is coded in ICD-9, um, which is a sort of vaguely hierarchical term, term set for clinical diagnoses. Um, ICD-10 is going to become the operational terminology later this year, and for uh, the Meaningful Use Initiative, SNOMED, um, which is a, a, much, uh, a much richer ontology, is going to become the standard 
diagnostic terminology. So again, my advice here is when you're thinking about how to classify diagnoses, try to get yourself to something like SNOMED because not only is it going to become a more widely accepted standard, but it gives you the ability to navigate around in the hierarchy and aggregate terms in a way that's really hard. I mean, for instance, it's really it's difficult in ICD-9 to express a concept like strep pharyngitis, right? There's a diagnosis code for streptococcal infection. There's a diagnosis code for pharyngitis. They're not in any way related to each other, and there's not a good way to navigate from one to the other. SNOMED gives you ways to make those connections. Okay. All right, rounding out the, uh, the classes of data, there are things that I call well-defined. We all know what we're saying, but they're hard to get to, right? The, the classic things here are uh, dictated reports, right? So pathology reports, imaging reports, micro reports. These are easy to get your hands on. They're just hard to interpret in an automated way. And so it's difficult to get some of the scale that you want from EHRs. Um, when you're working on these, if you're doing multi-institutional studies, you also need to be aware that the, the place that they're stored may be diff different from place to place, as well as the, uh, the representation they're stored in. <laughs> From a research perspective, what we would like to do is get to more discrete data here, right? Um, and so the, the, uh, the research team's mantra is the more you can get the EHR to represent discrete data, the more I can get at that data, the more I can reason over populations, the more I can uh, draw better conclusions. So that tends to create some pressure to use things like defined terminologies, summary fields, drop-down lists, forms, that sort of thing. Um, for the clinicians taking care of the patients, the mantra is every form I have to fill out takes more time than it takes me to write a note. So what's the benefit to me and my patient um, to trying to represent these things as a bunch of questionnaires, All right? And <clears throat> what that means uh, from a research perspective is you want to engage in a social contract with the users of your EHR, right? You want to make it easy to participate here. So the idea is to use the data available to you, not just to get the research done, but to make clinical care better, right? Don't make people enter data twice. So if you're gonna ask them to enter it for research purposes, make sure that that flows into notes and letters and, and orders and that sort of thing. If you're asking them to enter data that they're not used to entering, tell them why, right? Give them the evidence that, that explains why this is, why it's important to have this, uh, um, this additional data. Uh, make use of the tools for them. So what you're seeing up here is a, uh, uh, little panel that we put together as part of a decision support intervention for kids with otitis media. And what we've done is we've aggregated the last two years of a patient's otitis related history because one of the problems that you encounter in seeing patients is not so much figuring out whether the kid with a fever and a painful ear needs antibiotics today, but catching the kid who comes in with a borderline ear infection whom you're seeing on an off day and missing the fact that this is the fifth time that this has happened to them and their speech delayed, right? So, uh, as part of the contract with the, uh, the physician, make the tools work better for them and they'll be more interested in, uh, in helping you make the tools even better next time. Right. Here is one approach to that that we're doing as part of a, uh, a multi-site collaboration around taking care of kids with inflammatory bowel disease. Right? So one of the things that we found was we captured discrete data about medications and lab values. We weren't really having uh, an easy time getting data about symptoms and quality of life. And that was having to be done uh, by manual chart abstraction after visits. So what we've done is designed a form that allows the, the uh, clinician to kind of walk through the key questions about a patient's symptomatology, um, hopefully with a couple of clicks, get the information that they want together. And then this will flow into notes, it will flow into letters, it will flow into recommendations about, uh, about treatment. So by asking for that extra minute from the clinician, or in some cases from the patient, we return value to them uh, and not just to the research process. Okay, the last of the data categories, the non-discrete and complex data. So this is the free text problem, right? This, this is where things go to live in notes, where not only does the structure vary because I write differently than you write, uh, but the vocabulary varies and the, the level of, uh, of precision may vary as well, okay? Um, the reason this is difficult is because while any of us could read any of our notes and hopefully handwriting aside, and the EHR does help that, uh, come to a sense of what the meaning was, it's really hard to get a computer to do that, right? So when you're stuck with free text, you end up uh, sort of going down the road rapidly to some very difficult computational problems. 
try to sort of pare them down where you can, right? Use a keyword search um, where you have domain specific vocabulary. So people are, who are only likely to use 30 or 40 terms to express something, then uh, um, try to sort of anchor on that. Um, stack the deck, right? See if you can get the clinicians to be consistent in how they say things. Um, see if you can be consistent in the tools you give them to say things in a consistent way. Because if you don't, what you end up with is a mess like this. So this comes across really blurry, but this is a chunk of code out of that, uh, that Otitis project that was necessary to just parse the one line ear exam, right? So um, with, with this much work, we could get about 90% accuracy in figuring out what the clinician thought was going on in the patient's ears. And <clears throat> <laughs> that makes things a lot more complex. Now, having said that, in the current state of play in the HRs, that's, it's often worth it to make that investment in complexity, right? So what we got back from parsing those ear exams is 25% of the visits where the physician coded a diagnosis of otitis, they said that the patient had a normal ear exam, right? Because what they were trying to say was, I'm ruling out otitis, or they had otitis, but it's resolved now. But if we had only been using diagnosis codes, we would have missed that entirely. Uh, here's another quick example. Uh, we worked on a set of potential uh, adolescent preventive care quality measures based in the EHR. And this is looking at a set of about 50,000 adolescents seen over an 18-month period at CHOP. Uh, if you want information on sexual activity and you go to the fields in EPIC where you can record in you know, all of the detail a quality measure might want it, whether a person is sexually active or not, how, whether they've had multiple partners, whether they're using contraception, that sort of thing, you get about 2,000 of these 50,000 patients. It's not fabulous if you go to the notes, but you get about three times more um, if you dig into the note because that's where people write it. Right? Um, an even more extreme case, you know, um, if you're looking for normal depression screening, the quality measures as they were initially written uh, looked in the EHR for discrete evidence that screening questionnaires were used. CHOP would have caught 17 of the 50,000 patients. On the other hand, if you look in our note template, 45,000 of those patients actually had a depression screen. You just need to take the time to look in the right place. All right, so on this data structure grid, what you want to do is live up here in the upper right-hand corner. Right? What you want to try to do is avoid living down here in the free text world. What you're probably going to spend most of your time, if you're lucky, doing is living somewhere on, uh, on the right half of the graph. Try to stack the deck in your favor, right? Look for primary outcomes that are represented in discrete data. Use standardized terminologies wherever you can. Get the clinicians to help you interpret their data and to record it in a consistent way and do that by making it easier for patients and clinicians to get what they need from data capture. All right, on those principles, what I wanna do is walk through a set of kind of worked examples that I hope will be uh, useful in kind of helping us think about EHR data uh, EHR data in practice. So I'm going to start with a study that we did in the PeedsNet Collaborative looking at obesity in kids in the U.S. So we took six large children's hospitals uh, spread across the United States. We went back and retrieved data from a two-year window uh, in outpatient visits, and that included demographics diagnoses and direct anthropometrics, right? And then looking at the characteristics of our data, one of the things that was clear is people measure weights a lot more than heights. Um, and in general, heights change a lot less erratically than weights. So uh, knowing how those data were captured, we were able to come back and use an imputation strategy to uh, regularize some of that height data. Right? So what we end up with is a sample of about 800,000 children, about three and a half million visits, that has about the primary care, specialty care, uh, and age and sex breakdown that you expect of the United States population. So the first question we wanted to ask here was, how useful are things like height and weight data recorded in the EHR, right? You know, we, we all sort of know of times where somebody has said to a parent, so about how much does your child weigh and kind of write that down, or kids are squirmy or they're not. This is all very different from the very careful, very controlled, um, reproducible measurements that surveys like NHANES or uh, even the, the CRC here uh, does. Well, it turns out that these data are actually pretty good. So what we're doing here is looking at a bunch of measures of data quality. Um, and the numbers you're seeing in here are percents of measurements. So you'll see in general, 99.8% of these measurements behave in a consistent way uh, in almost all of these measurements, uh, in all, almost all these quality measures. The one case where you see a real variation is decreasing height 
over time. So kids who are seeing you know, once in March and once in June, and they're shorter in June than they are in March. Um, and in particular, what that shows you, leaving aside this one outlier who had a lot of that going on, is about a 1% to 2% range. Turns out that most of these are kids passing their second birthday. Right? And so at the last visit, they were measured recumbent, and at the next visit, they're measured standing, and it actually makes sense that their height went down by 2%. If you jack that number up to 5 or 10%, uh, again, the data becomes very consistent. So we emerged from this with the sense that at least we weren't getting a ton of scatter in our data. What we did get was tremendous breadth of data. Right? So what we're looking at here is the number of body mass index measurements we were able to make for each month of age. And <clears throat> What you're seeing is that we have 6,000 data points for virtually every month of age between birth and about 17 years of age, uh, and then things tail off as kids age out of pediatric systems. That lets us make estimates of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, effectively growth curves and obesity that are highly precise. Right? So what you see here is a red curve that's using those 6,000 measurements per month to estimate the mean body mass index at a given age. The, um, the constellation of little green X's that scatters around that is what NHANES uses, right? So N NHANES is working with about 20 kids per, uh, uh, per month of age to generate the growth charts that we use every day. And you know, what they rely on are very precise individual measurements and then a fairly intensive statistical correction to account for the fact that there is a lot of heteroscedasticity in their data because they're dealing with a small number of data points. So this is in some respects the brute force alternative, right? When you have 6,000 data points per month of age, whatever you lose in the precision of individual measurements kind of averages itself out. Um, and you get highly accurate and highly precise estimates of body mass index. Right? And if you translate those into things like prevalence of obesity, what you'll see is NHANES prevalence values and our prevalence values line up very closely, right? So um, the end result is that we end up generating obesity rates using this EHR-derived data that uh, <clears throat> track very, very closely with the uh, highly precise national survey estimates. So we were heartened by that. And we were heartened by that for a couple of reasons. One is it lets us look at this process of clinical care, right? So now we know who's obese, right? Because we can look at your body mass index. So we said, okay, let's make the analogy to administrative data. How often when someone is actually obese does a clinician record that diagnosis? The answer is about 18% of the time, okay? Um, if you're in a weight management clinic, then that's about 80 or 90% of the time. Otherwise, nobody does better than about one in three. So this means a couple of things. One is there's a lot of discordance between uh, what we see in terms of obesity and what we say in terms of obesity. So within the EHR, you need to think about that when you're trying to design things like clinical decision support or secondary screening or that sort of thing. The other thing that this means is you want to think about what outcome you're measuring, right? Any study you do in administrative data loses 80% of your cases automatically, right? Because they didn't get the diagnosis code. So this is one of those places where having the primary data available is a key benefit to you. It's not clear why we underdose this heavily. Um, we sort of surveyed some physicians informally, and um, some of it has to do with chronicity, some of it has to do with people viewing it as a, a sort of case for counseling as opposed to medical therapy. Some of it was frankly, I don't get paid for it, and so I don't code the diagnosis, uh, that sort of thing. One of the things you want to be careful about is make sure you're looking in the right place, make sure you're looking by the right name. So, you know, we looked at visit diagnoses. One of the first things that came up was, well, maybe it's a chronic condition, maybe it's on the problem list. So it turns out that if we go back and look at the problem list, we take our diagnosis rate from 17% to 21%. So we're not missing a lot there. Um, maybe we're using the wrong set of codes. So we go back and look at what's common in kids who are obese. There aren't a lot of obesity-related codes, although one of the things that we did find out was that one of the six hospitals had as their leading code for obesity, the ICD-9 code for uh, abnormal weight gain, which in the world of ICD-9 is in a totally different part of the coding space, and so you wouldn't catch it unless you knew that was coming. Right? Again, no that data. What this let us do, in addition to being able to look at uh, primary outcomes are because we had a population of 800,000 or in this particular figure 650,000 children we can spot clinical correlations that are really hard to see in smaller samples. So what you're looking at here is a list of 
all of the diagnoses that are more common in obese kids than in the population at large uh, with a uh, couple of constraints. One is that you had to have at least 100 people have the diagnosis so that we weren't judging more common, less common based on you know, five kids. Um, and the second, that it had to be a, a, a coded diagnosis. We weren't going back and screening line values and that sort of thing. And you see some of the things you expect in obese patients, right? The things that are skewed are things like diabetes, hypertension. But you, know, you also notice that you are picking up associations with things like acute leukemia, right? Not a big surprise to me as an oncologist. I use a lot of steroids to treat kids who have acute leukemia. As it turns out, there's a, there's a long-term risk of obesity. Um, <clears throat> it's evident in this data. It's not evident in most other data. Uh, interestingly, septicemia is more, is more common in kids who are obese. Hard to know what's the cause and what's the effect there, right? Uh, it may be a, a sort of coincidental association, right? Um, and so on down, right? This, uh, we, we sort of cut off at about 30 diagnoses here. So we were able to take advantage of primary outcome data and of the population size to unmask these correlations. Okay. Uh, let's look at another case. So this is research using the Improved Care Now, the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Program Registry. This, is, this was a collection of, at the time, 35 different uh, pediatric gastroenterology practices designed to make the quality of care better for kids with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Right? So part of what we asked is, what can we do to make the data that they collect for QI suitable for research? So again, know the data, right? Um, you have to do a fair amount of data cleaning and transformation, and you have the opportunity to augment the data that are there by you know, using, a, using different techniques. Some of them are really simple, right? So uh, you, know, you can just look for missing data um, and uh, take pieces from one end of the visit and the other end of the visit and regularize them, right? Or you can say, well, there's some data on the abdominal exam that will help me know something about the perirectal exam. Uh, you can do something as simple as calculating height velocity across visits, right? Uh, the second thing you can do is, again, you can deploy imputation. Ouch, this didn't make it across the Mac to PC well either. But what you're looking at here is uh, a box plot of us doing imputations against this multi-symptom uh, index or multi-component index called the PCDAI, the Pediatric Crohn's Disease Activity Index. So that's 11 different characteristics of the disease, symptoms, lab values, uh, growth, that sort of stuff, that uh, gives you an indication of disease severity, right? And we're using different imputation techniques here to look at kids who are in remission, kids who have mild disease, and kids who have moderate to severe disease. And what, um, what we found is if you didn't impute anything, 17% of the kids had enough data to, uh, to be able to measure a PCDAI. So if you wanted to use that as an outcome measure, you lost 83% of your patients. Uh, using imputation strategies that maintained pretty clearly this distinction between uh, remission, mild, and moderate disease, and that lined up nicely with those 17% of the kids who had fully observed data. That's the left bar in each group. We were able to impute PCDAI scores for 90% of the population. So without um, loss of accuracy, we could use the other data in the visit because we had those primary data to recover this composite disease index for a large fraction of our patients. Okay, so given that outcome to measure, how do we go on to study it? Well, one of the things we have to account for is, again, this is opportunistic data. It's collected whenever the patients come in for visits. And so it's a lot harder to say, this is your day zero study visit, this is your day 30 study visit, this is your day 90 visit. What we do is take this sort of scatter over time and post hoc arrange it so that we have groups of kids who, in, uh, for this particular study, were on biologic therapy or not on biologic therapy looking at the interval, the sort of normalized time from an index event, right? And created an analytic structure that looks like a randomized controlled trial. And what that lets us do is, moder is model treatment effects in the same way that you would in a randomized controlled trial and show, for instance, on uh, these kind of survival estimates that the time to remission and the fraction of patients who remain in remission is higher uh, for kids with moderate to severe, severe disease who get biologic agents than kids who get steroids and, uh, and thiopurines. Uh, <laughs> a very valuable question for us because while it looked 
uh, like this was likely to be the case based on randomized trials, it was entirely unclear whether questions of cost or adherence or availability was going to make this the case in practice. So again, by starting with these data that were designed for quality improvement and by building up the infrastructure you needed to do research, we're able to answer clinical questions using the EHR. Right? Um, <laughs> what I'm simply showing here is if you use multiple different analytic methods, you get about the same number needed to treat so that the, the data are fairly stable. Uh, so I've been talking mostly about the afferent arm of a learning health system, right? Getting data and learning more. How do you change practice? I'm going to stick with ICN for a couple of minutes here, and I'm going to look at the efferent piece of what they're doing. So they take this data in, uh, they compare data from patient to patient and from site to site for a set of agreed upon benchmarks, and then those data get returned to the sites at both the population level and at the patient level to close that loop. So not only are they, they sort of taking in knowledge to, uh, to get us better sense of how populations behave, but then that provides them a platform to say, if I compare CHOP to Vermont, to Cincinnati, to Seattle, um, I can spot outliers and at least ask the question, is there something different about the population or is what's different the process of care, right? So how does this look in practice? Um, what's returned are population level reports that for instance, um, tell you simple things like descriptives of your population, but then how many of your kids are in remission, right? How many of your kids have mild disease? How many of your kids have severe disease? Um, how does that look for each of your patients, right? So kind of patient by patient, who, um, who is doing as well as we would hope based on the information available, right? And what this has done over the five years or so that the collaborative has been in existence is take remission rates from the high 50s, low 60s to the high 70s, low 80s. Um, I want to be a little careful about attribution there because that's also roughly the era that biologics came into wider use. It's not just a matter uh, probably of uh, uh, better QI, but these tools are clearly helping to make sure that, uh, that kids are being managed in a consistent way. And that feeds back at the patient level too. So one of the things that ICN centers get for every patient as they're visiting, uh, as they come in for a visit, is this summary of their recent care, including what their disease has been doing, um, what's been going on in terms of uh, preventive care, how their labs have been trending out, and then you know, what are the recommendations for care that should be delivered now in order to make sure that you're keeping up with all of the things that you want to do for these kids. All right? So it's not just taking in knowledge, but translating it back to the site of care. I've been talking mostly about big multi-site collaborations. I wanted to throw in at least one sort of can do in your own garage kind of example uh, of uh, the efferent arm. So I'm, I'm showing some of the stuff that we're doing around influenza immunization and oncology uh, because not all of these things need to be done across five or six children's hospitals. Right? So um, like a lot of specialty divisions, we have a large population of patients at high risk for complications from flu and we would like to get them immunized. We're actually not entirely sure that the immunization is particularly effective when you're getting chemotherapy, but it's pretty clear that it's not harmful and uh, the data about effectiveness are conflicting, so you may get some benefit. We tried for a while to educate patients and families, to mark charts, to uh, sort of raise awareness, and we found that, that rates plateaued in the high 50s for most patients. So we started asking, how can the EHR help? Now, uh, if you're in other specialty practices or you've been implementing this from the, uh, uh, the EPIC side, you know that for many specialties, there's a best practice alert. That, um, that drives immunization at clinic visits. Um, and this works well for a lot of cases. It turns out that part of the reason this works well is because among the list of right things to do when you're trying to uh, um, provide the decision support, um, we tick a lot of the boxes here, right? So it's information that we know is good. It's being delivered at the right time to the right person. It's happening right in the visit and it's actionable. You can click on a button there and you can uh, get to flu immunization. It turns out in oncology, this doesn't work, right? And it doesn't work for two reasons. One is this system is dependent on knowing at the beginning of, se of September who your high risk patients are. And we have kids sort of moving in and out of that high risk population all the time. The second problem is that just it's just technical. It's the way immunizations happen in an oncology clinic is different from other clinics. So the, the action this takes you to doesn't work in oncology. So what did we do? We took a, another, we took a sort of back-end low-tech approach based on reporting. So 
For each day in each of our clinics, there's an automated report that runs every morning based on scheduled visits, and that, uh, that takes each patient and classifies them as high risk or not. And then if you're high risk, are you vaccine eligible? Because some of our kids are not if you've had a bone marrow transplant recently or that sort of thing. And then if you're vaccine eligible, do you need a dose today, right? Are you immunized or not? If, you, if you're immunized, do you need a second dose? That sort of thing. That gets delivered to the triage stations and clinic every morning. And then as they see each patient, they consult this list. And you know, if you're in the red, needs a dose, uh, needs hasn't started yet, or the yellow started, but you need two doses uh, category, you get a wristband. And then when your doctor or NP sees you, they know that you need a flu shot that day. Um, if you're in the green category and you've been immunized, we stop bugging you all year about whether or not you got your flu shot. So does it work? Um, it turns out that we, when we compare the year in which we deployed this to the previous year, what we saw was about a 20% increase in uh, kids shifting into fully immunized and about the same uh, decrement in kids shifting out of unimmunized. So we went from a, a high 50s rate to about 85% of our patients getting at least one dose of their flu vaccine and about 70% of them being fully immunized according to the CDC guidelines. So I, I think it's important to put that out there because not every uh, operation of the learning health system has to be sort of big and complicated. There, there are, are real impacts that you can make on a retail level as well. All right, so given those examples, uh, what conclusions am I gonna propose here? Um, I've tried to make the case that EHR-derived data provides a unique opportunity for if, uh, effectiveness research. So basically looking at how the process of clinical care in the real world operates, right? It's becoming better because there are more patients captured by EHRs and because you get a clear clinical representation of the data. It does provide its own methodologic challenges around the process by which the data are captured and the fact that most of the data that's available now is really observational. There's relatively little data getting into EHRs specifically for the purpose of research. That will change. Okay. Uh, we found those challenges to be tractable in the cases that we've looked at. Uh, I'm sure that there will be cases that, that will stymie us in the future, but uh, so far there have been ways around most of these challenges, uh, and they allow us to, to obtain answers to clinically relevant questions that change patient care. So where do we go from here, from our perspective? Um, <clears throat> I've talked about PEDSNET, the collaborative of six children's hospitals. Well, um, what you may have seen over the last six months or so is that PCORI, uh, which was chartered to uh, really anchor patient-centered clinical effectiveness research, has uh, decided that they're going to invest a lot of the resources in this national network called PCORNET, right? So uh, <clears throat> that they can realize their vision for a learning health system, which puts the point of care right at the middle of these interactions between patients, families, and clinicians, but also connects it to things like registries and connects it to long-term patient outcomes in order to uh, have a sort of connect a uh, well-linked national infrastructure for clinical research. So PCORNET is just getting off the ground. Uh, the initial version includes 11 of what PCORI calls CDRNs or clinical data research networks. These are mostly health systems and they're mostly contributing data out of their electronic health records. So these are large populations providing clinical data, and 18 patient-powered research networks, which are generally anchored by patient advocacy groups or by registries, and are providing uh, patient-submitted <coughs> patient data out of their registry infrastructure. Um, taken together, these provide some information on about 100 million patients in the US, and the goal is to make this a responsive and flexible infrastructure for clinical research. So what does that mean at home? Uh, CHOP as an institution is the anchor for uh, PEDSNET participating in PCORNET. So we have a group of eight children's hospitals who are collaborating uh, to uh, represent children in particular uh, in this national infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> that's not to say that the only kids in PCORNET are from pediatric hospitals. So among these other 11 CDRNs are uh, big groups like Kaiser, uh, or citywide groups, uh, virtually the entire city of New York, the entire city of Chicago um, are included in consortia here. Um, and also, by the way, uh, this neighborhood is home to three of the 18 patient-powered research networks as well. Right? So I expect the 
that I'll be talking a lot more in the next couple of years about how this is working to create a national data resource for uh, the learning health system, both in the research arm and in quality improvement, uh, and how we can move from an observational model to an interventional model on the back of this kind of uh, infrastructure. Okay, let me stop there. I'm going to leave acknowledgments up here because this is uh, a <clears throat> This work is certainly anchored by a cast of thousands, uh, in particular the sites who contribute data to PEDSnet, the folks who have done some of the analytics around PEDSnet, uh, <clears throat> the group in CVMI who, uh, who anchored the programming for the, and the, the decision support for the Otitis projects I've talked about, uh, the now 50 sites in Improved Care Now, um, and the Pediatric uh, Research Terminologies Project that uh, Mike talked about in a lot more detail. I don't want to miss here that what's really anchoring this data uh, uh, or this research is 832,000 patients in PEDSnet and 8,000 patients with IBD in Improved Care Now and so on and so on. All right, thank you very much for your time. I'd be happy to take any questions.